facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park and have been made possible in part by Ravinia Festival, CJE Senior Life, Gand Music and Sound. Hello, and welcome to Conman's Current Events Roundtable. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I know myself, I don't always know too much about the subject. And that is why I have Julie Strauss, Dr. Julie Strauss, who is going to be talking about the Electoral College Arguments For and Against. And that is why, Julie, I brought you on the show. Not because of anything else, because I don't understand the topic myself. And I thought, if I don't understand it, uh, a lot of other people don't as well. And I thought this would be a good educational program today. Absolutely. And I want to thank you. I know you resisted me for, for a while coming on the show, and I'm so happy to have you back. Thank Again, you thank very you much. for it's coming on the show. I'm going to just read a, just a, a little uh, introduction, and then we will go into the subject. Although elections seem like they should be cut and dried and straightforward, they are in reality quite messy, which is certainly reflected in the debate over the Electoral College. There are strong and compelling arguments on both sides of the issue, which we will delve into today. So be on, uh, <laughs> be on uh, topic on this. This is very important. First, how the Electoral College works. Then we'll discuss its flaws and its reasons for abolishing it, improving on it, or simply leaving it as is. And before I start, I want to read, you know, I, since it's my show, I get to read a question from my grandson, Jacob, who lives in Austin, Texas. And he asked me to ask you this. How are we still a democracy if, if, our, voters don't, if our votes don't really count? So how are we a democracy? And I guess it was in that election with Gore and Bush where Gore won the popular, popular vote and President Bush became president because he won the electoral votes. So according to Jacob, he doesn't understand, are we really a democracy if his vote doesn't count? Well, I think that's a good question to start with, but let's, we should maybe talk a little bit about how it works so okay. that you can understand um, how it is and isn't purely democratic, but how the Electoral College works is that um, every state has a certain number of electors that is determined by the number of House members and senators that they have added together, and the total number of electors is 538 and you need to win 270 to win the presidency. And this does not apply in any other election, only for presidential contests. So governor, they don't have electoral vote or any other? Right, just only for the president. Pres and not the vice president, just for the president. Well, the vice president and the president run together right. on the ticket. Right, right. right. Um, so each state then Almost all of the 50 states have what's called a winner-take-all system where whoever wins 50 plus one vote in the presidential election wins all of the state's electors. So because of that system, then you, uh, the, um, you win a, a huge number of the state even if you only win 50 percent or 50 plus one. And then those electors are assigned to you as the candidate if you're running for president. And um, 
the so the so the, it is democratic to your grandson's question in that, but it is indirect in that the votes of the people of Illinois, for example, matter up until the 50% plus one, and then all of the 20 electoral votes goes to whoever, whichever candidate gets the 50%. Right, but who 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 are the electors? How do, I, I don't I don't think we we don't vote for them. Who votes for the electors? Well, the electors are selected by um, the candidates. They, uh, in each state, they have an operation that they put together a slate of electors. And actually, though, technically, when you're voting for president, you are voting for the slate of electors uh, indirectly. You're not directly pulling the lever for President Obama or for um, John McCain, for example. Mm -hmm. So you are um, pulling the slate for the electors, and then they meet on the first Monday after the first Wednesday of December, and they vote. But usually it's determined by who wins the popular vote, which is always determined in November on election Now, day. does the electors have to vote the way the people want the electors to vote? Say, um, say we want the electors to vote for one candidate and not the other. Can it happen where the electors vote who for what they want or for who they want and not follow the, the vote for the, peop the people? Well, that's an excellent question. And in fact, actually, it is not written in law that you must vote for the candidate that you pledged to vote for when the votes were cast on election day. And um, the, uh, there, there is the mainly theoretical, um, hypothetical situation of the quote unquote faithless elector who when it's time to vote, decides to vote for somebody else. And this did happen one time in recent history in 1988 when one elector voted for Lloyd Benson to be the president and Michael Dukakis to be the vice president instead of the way that they were running on the ticket. Um, but this has only happened very, very infrequently. So this is a theoretical problem, but not a, a, a practical problem. Do the people, you could get a list of the electors in your state? How do they, how do you know who your electors are? You can find out, absolutely. It's usually, again, party officials, people who have connected to the campaign or to the state party. And for the most part, it's a, a honorary pro forma role to play uh, because the election is decided by the popular vote, and this is an added layer that has been placed on it by the founders in an attempt to um, have a compromise because originally they uh, wanted to have the president to be either elected by Congress, which they rejected as one anecdote um, said that they thought there would be too many hard feelings among members of Congress if they were then uh, asked to vote for the president in terms of making these big decisions. Uh, and the other alternative that they had was that it would be by state legislature. Uh, but they rejected those options and came up with this sort of two-tiered approach where there would be a popular election, but also this other layer of the electoral college on top of that. Now, people don't realize that people think that their vote is the, the vote. And, you know, it, it's kind of frustrating because I remember um, when Gore lost, and he won the popular vote. Right, by half a million votes. Yeah, and, and Bush got elected because the uh, the electoral college. And then I remember in Florida, they had the hanging chads that were hanging, and they had a right. recount and right. everything of this. And um, and I think to this day, Gore thinks he was the president. Well. <laughs> Cause um, he, because, I, you know, every time he's on a show, you know, he, he you know acts like he would, should have been the president, and he feels like he was cheating. It. So a lot of people feel that, um, you know, going back to my grandson's question, is it a democracy if your vote doesn't really count? You feel kind of cheated and, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, there is that. That is one of the biggest problems is that in four instances in our history, the Electoral College has not reflected the popular vote and the most recent being in 2000. Uh, the argument, one of the arguments or counter arguments is that 
the person who wins the popular vote of the most states wins the presidency, not the popular vote across the whole country in the sense that you have to win it, you have to really carry the election in enough states and that you really need to understand that states are one of the building blocks of the country and that it is not a direct connection between the presidency and the individual, that there is this um, other institution the, of the, the states that have this role to play. And so one way of looking at it is that the founders wanted to make the states integral to the system. Otherwise, you could imagine a system where, especially today's elections, you run primarily in urban areas. Uh, to get the most votes and not pay much attention to rural areas or only run in one region of the country that is very populous mm -hmm. and not focus on other regions of the country. And that uh, could present a different set of problems in terms of how presidents are elected or in terms of the kinds of candidates that win. Um, and in this system, while it certainly has its flaws, you um, are forcing the candidates to think about the state as one of the um, building blocks of forming their campaigns. Now does, does a, a candidate, if they're running, wouldn't they be then focusing on states that have more electoral votes and forgetting about the ones that have less electoral votes? Because, you know, so, because I know sometimes our candidates, we, we hear, oh, they're in, uh, they're, say they're in Delaware, they're in Washington, or something, or in Florida, and nobody comes to Illinois. And you wonder, why are they not coming? Nobody's coming to our state. You know, it's like, are, are we forgotten about? What, you know, what, what is that about? Why, why, so they, is that kind of fair, that if a state has more electoral votes and then they concentrate on that state and not the other states that have less votes? Well, it's not exactly the amount of electoral votes. It's where, um, which states have almost an equal number of either Republican and or Democratic and independent voters. So that's called a swing state. So that's what we call a swing state or quote unquote a purple state, which mixing the red and the blue. Yeah. So the candidates, while they will go certainly to California and New York and Illinois to raise money, um, they are going to spend most of their time and uh, campaign energy and certainly their television ads and all of that in the swing states, where which are really technically states that have gone um, one way for one president and uh, a Republican, and then um, the other way for a Democrat. And those swing states, um, that is one of the biggest problems with the Electoral College, is that the um, about 79 percent of the population of the United States do not live in swing states. So that leaves only 21% who get bombarded uh, with ads and mm -hmm. visits. And those swing states tend to be, um, a lot actually are in the Midwest, but not Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, sometimes Michigan, Florida for sure is heavily fought over. Yeah. And so they get the most attention from the candidates because if they are able to get 50 plus 1 percent of their supporters mm -hmm. to vote, then they get all of the electoral votes of those states, and that's really the tipping balance point for the election. Are, are there are only a couple of states that have the, the winner takes all? Is Actually, um, 50 of the 50 states, 48 are winner take all. Two are not, which are Maine and Nebraska, and they are proportional, and so they award their electoral college votes based on a uh, proportion of the vote that each candidate wins. Um, however, neither Maine nor Nebraska have that many electoral votes, and they are not uh, swing states. So that doesn't really impact, although some people would suggest that that would be a possible solution would be to make the votes for the electoral college proportional rather than winner take all. It would be good if everybody, in, in a way, I mean, it should be everybody, should, every state should really be a swing state instead of, it, you know, every, it, feel, it feels funny that uh, one state is supposedly all Democrat, all Republican. And when I talk to people and I run current events classes and stuff, people are independent. And when I, when I, when they seem to be uh, half as Republican, half as Democrat, 
you know, they come to, like, say, current events, uh, discussion groups, or come to your lecture groups that you do a lot of lecturing. And, and then, it, then we find out that our state is just one, you know, it, it's, it's just... blue, right? It's blue. Right. I mean, it should be... It'd be nice to have every state independent. So sometimes they would choose Democrat. Sometimes they would choose Republican rather right. than... Well, every, it's not to suggest... Two, you know, that's a good point. It's not to suggest that just because Illinois is traditionally a blue state that everyone in Illinois is, is a Democratic voter, hardly. But it does suggest that the majority of the voters who turn out regularly for presidential elections vote more, support Democratic candidates. And in, if you look back in history and go through the two Obama campaigns and then Kerry and then Gore, Illinois has consistently voted um, for 50 plus one, at least, for the Democratic candidate. So that's where the label comes from. That doesn't suggest that there aren't maybe 40 percent or 35 percent or whatever the exact number is of Republicans. It just means that they are more tilting towards one party than the other, and they are able to consistently turn in those results. Now, are the states that are swing states are usually the same states, or do they change also? Well, that is a good question, in that they have changed over, if you take the long view, and go back um, to the 60s or so, um, some of the states that are no longer considered swing states, one that comes to mind is Tennessee, used to be considered more of a swing state. Now it's consistently Republican in its presidential vote. And this is really applying only in, in our, for our discussions for the presidential. Um, but many states have been consistently swing states, particularly Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Ohio. Missouri is another that used to be considered more of a swing state, and it also has become more red, mm -hmm. um, more Republican-leaning uh, in recent elections. So it does change but not uh, certainly gradually. Now, how does, you know, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about, um, there, there's been talk about changing the Electoral College and, or dropping it or improving it or getting rid of abolishing it. Uh, let's talk about why, what would be the advantages of keeping it and the disadvantages of, of getting rid of it and the, the, the advantages of changing it. Okay. So well, that's the, a big question. Okay, so the so advantages, you, yeah. <laughs> I'll try to unpack that. Um, the advantages, uh, some people's view of, of keeping it is that um, one of the things that it, it does well, given that it is winner take all in the states, is that it does make it difficult for third parties, and some people would see this as a positive, others see this as a negative, to really mount a challenge at the presidential level because they need to not just win a, sub, a substantial amount of votes, they need to win a majority of votes in enough states to really have a presence. And that's very, very difficult given the apparatus that you need to get out the vote and have all of the organization that the Democratic and Republican parties have. Um, and so what actually happens, though, is the parties do a pretty good job of co-opting the, the um, movements that, that percolate up that have been perhaps potential third parties but then get absorbed. And one of my favorite examples in, is in 1992 with Ross Perot, who kind of burst on the scene talking a lot yeah, about okay. economic what issues. To Ross Perot? Right. <laughs> right. Is he hiding under the table? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't heard from him a long, um, long time. But he talked a lot about economic issues, which was a theme of the 1992 mm -hmm. campaign, if you remember, between President Bush, um, George Herbert Walker Bush, and Bill Clinton. Uh, but he focused more on the deficit than either of the two candidates, um, and certainly Clinton was pushing the economy. It's the economy, stupid, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, and then you found not soon after that then President Clinton and President Bush, uh, candidate Clinton, I should mm -hmm. say, and President Bush were starting to speak about mm -hmm. the deficit. And so Ross Perot um, was able to have a real impact, but they were quick to change their rhetoric and not sideline him as much as um, adopt some of his issues and so so it made him weaker, weaker right it made him weaker yeah. but they were hearing that yeah. he was getting support from voters so they were quick to to jump on an issue 
where you might not see that in other systems which are more coalition based and then the parties are more issue based. Our parties are coalitions um, and you can look back in history and see how they've really changed their positions on issues depending on where their voters mm -hmm. Feel. And um, you're seeing that now, particularly with the Republican Party as well, with the Tea Party and the establishment, they are really kind of waging a, a war. It's almost, it's almost like another party. Right. Yeah. But they're not coming. going to likely break yeah. out, break off because of their chances of winning mm -hmm. the presidency will not be very strong. Uh, and so you see this happening. It becomes an internecine war. Mm -hmm. The the other way it would happen would be it would be at the government level and if the coalitions can't stay uh, together and they break apart then the government falls. Our coalitions are within the It'll parties. It would be sort of like, not the Israeli, the like the Israeli type government, the parliament right. system where they are in you know, different countries. A few parties that right. control um, the votes of a few of their members mm -hmm. and then they need to be mm -hmm. sure that they're on the same page with the major parties. We don't have that, and that's because of the electoral system to a large extent and the winner-take-all way that you win um, so many votes if you get this 50%. So in that sense, I think that's um, something to think about before deciding to get rid of the system mm -hmm. because it might lead to, if you abolished it, a lot more parties that so crop up, and that could really Throw change the whole, the whole system, system right, from how we've at least yeah. been doing it thus far. Um, not to say that it would necessarily be bad, but it would be a lot of tumult, <laughs> um, at least for the short term. Um, so that's one of the um, advantages. Another one that uh, comes to mind is that it is um, important to a lot of people that they be a strong, a, 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 the winner have a large majority or a, a significant majority and that is demonstrated in the Electoral College because thinking about it from a government standpoint you want whoever wins to feel that they have won uh, strongly enough that they will govern mm -hmm. and not that their election be called into question like, like what their, happened with the Bush right, into their, go back to the, the, the Bush um, Gore situation because right. they always felt that he wasn't really the president. A lot of people said, well, he really wasn't the president, President Bush. Right. Gore should have been the president. And, you know, so that that's what happened well, for that's a long thinking. time after that. They Until were talking about they, but it seemed finally. like Bush was able to to assert that he had a mandate and certainly right, after 9-11 right. things changed. But, but the people, the, pop, the popular, whoever voted for him, the popular vote was uh, angered the people. Well, there was yeah. definitely a lot of questions yeah. raised about how and, to address this issue. And we still talk about it issue. today. Right. It's Absolutely. still very pertinent. 14 years yeah. later. Right. 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 Um, so so the, uh, one of the biggest proposals that's um, on the table to changing it is this um, national uh, interstate compact that has been uh, ad adopted by 10 states, all of them blue states, uh, where they have said that once there's enough states that equal the number the blue of 270. States, the blue states are the? More democratic okay. leaning states. Okay, and the red states, we just want to form our Make view. sure, yeah. right, are more <laughs> Republican yeah. leaning. Yeah. And these states have um, agreed that if they get to the magic number of 270, then they will, at the, for the next presidential election, give all of their electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote, even if their own mm -hmm. state did not vote for the, win the now, person this is, who won the popular vote. This is a constitutional vote. law. It's in the Constitution, the, the Electoral, Electoral College. College. Absolutely. So I think we need to inform our viewers because some people don't realize where, you know, it's a law. We weren't sure if it's a, just a state law, but it's a no, law it's of the, the land. It's in the Constitution. So in order to change the Constitution, you need the House of Representatives and the Congress, correct? The Senate. Well, the Senate. This is not, in order to amend the Constitution amend. to change yeah. the Electoral College, you would need, right, three, uh, two thirds of the um, both House and the Senate to approve an amendment, and then three quarters of the states, which is 38 states. 
which is really difficult. Um, and certainly, you would have to get them to agree mm -hmm. to change it all the same way. They would all have to agree to adopt whatever the, the uh, prescription is. Didn't you say something in a lecture that I heard that there's a way to get around it? There's another way to get around if you can't change by amending the Constitution, you can add something to it? N no, you can't. The, the way that this is, this national popular vote interstate compact has come about is because there is some language that says that um, states have the power to decide first how to apportion their electoral votes, which mm -hmm. we've discussed because okay. some states Maybe this is do it proportional it states, versus okay. winner take all. Okay. And that's up to the states um, to decide so they can change that. And then the so other. So the states can change it without right. amending the Constitution. Absolutely. Okay, right. this that's is what we stated in the about. Constitution. Right. Okay. And then the other piece is that they can enter into a binding interstate compact. So that's one idea is that these states, these 10 states, have agreed with each other that they will then throw their electoral votes towards the candidate who wins the most popular votes, even if those voters, say, for New Jersey, didn't vote for the candidate. Um, I think that that will be um, a, a, a very difficult sell as they get closer to this 270. Right now they have 165 electoral votes, so they still need another 105. But as it gets closer, I think there's going to be more scrutiny paid to this plan because in my reading of it, um, for example, if, the, if New Jersey didn't vote for the candidate that then wins the popular vote, they are still going to give 14 electoral votes from New Jersey to that candidate. So I think that does away with the vote, talk about undemocratic, of the majority of the voters of New Jersey. Um, I think that's going to be a problem. Other people who have looked at this um, see other problems with this, this uh, approach. One is that the swing states aren't going to like it. Um, as I said, 80% of voters are not in swing states, but those 20%, they have a lot of power and they have a lot of influence. And so they might not want to then have this compact determine who's going to win rather than...